Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Center for Fiction. My name is Melanie McNair. I'm the Senior Director of Public Programming here. Um, how many of you uh, have never been here before? Oh my goodness, so many of you, welcome. Um, we do events here all the time and we've got amazing things happening. So please sign up for our mailing list. If you don't know who we are, we're the only literary nonprofit that focuses on the creation and enjoyment of fiction. Um, and we're really thrilled tonight to celebrate an amazing book. Um, I wanna say a special hello also to those of you who are joining us on the live stream tonight. There are a lot of you. And a special thank you to our partners this evening, the Bellevue Literary Review. Uh, it's an award-winning independent literary journal that mines the intersection of healthcare and the arts. And Abraham has published fiction in BLR and has been a member of the advisory board since its inception in 2001. Um, before I introduce anybody else, I'm gonna tell you a couple of housekeeping announcements. One is, um, you all have your books, right? And they're already signed. Um, Abraham will not be uh, doing a personalization line because he's got a lot of uh, tour stops ahead of him and you know, um, you can get sick when you do that kind of thing. Um, so, um, so thank you for your understanding about that. Also, um, Abraham will, the format for this evening is Abraham is gonna present and then uh, Danielle will come on stage and ask a few questions while you all think of your questions. And when it's time to go to audience questions, raise your hand if you're here in this room and uh, one of our interns will bring a microphone to you. Please wait until you have the microphone because otherwise our friends watching online and upstairs, by the way, hi upstairs people, won't be able to hear you. So wait until the microphone when you raise your hand and if you're watching on YouTube, you can type your question at any time in the chat. And if you're watching in the overflow, Kristen will send your question to us. Uh, it's now my pleasure to introduce Danielle Ofri. She's the editor in chief and founder of the Bellevue Literary Review. Um, she's also a practicing physician and, and the author of six books. And she's going to introduce Abraham. So please welcome her to the stage. You know, there are, um, there are some books that are seminal in your life, um, these touchstones that cause you to reimagine who you are and where you are, are in that kind of rushing river of life. And for me, that was my own country, um, published by a then unknown writer, Abraham Verghese. And he wrote about his experiences um, as a newly arrived doctor in this country, working in small town Appalachia when, when HIV and AIDS was just coming up as this frightening, you know, deep and dark disease. And for me, a young medical resident who was drowning, you know, in the deaths of HIV during my training, I felt that someone had thrown me a lifeline, a, a literary lifeline, and I've been holding on to that ever since. Um, when, when Abraham, and I fell in love with all of his nonfiction, but when his first novel came out, Cutting for Stone, I have to confess, I was just a little bit hesitant, because you know when you have a beloved nonfiction writer and they turn to fiction and sometimes it doesn't quite work, well, I deemed have worried. Um, the book was, was simply stunning, and I read straight through the 500 plus pages, went back and read the first 75 right, right away. Um, it was such a, a wonderful book. And, and what I think is that Abraham really has this intrinsic sense of story. And, and that's what makes him a great physician, that he fully inhabits the stories of his patients. And I think that is what makes um, a good doctor great and a smart doctor wise. And um, also makes you a great novelist. Um, and so at BLR, we were very pleased to publish Abraham's short story in our fourth uh, issue of BLR way back when. Um, and the story was called If, if Brains um, Was Gas. And I remember he said, don't edit the title. Don't fix the subjunctive. Don't make it if brains were gas, if brains was gas. Um, and it's a wonderful short story. Um, BLR is still here 20 years later. This is our 44th issue. And so I'll make just one plug to support literary magazines with your subscriptions because that is where new fiction is born. Um, and after Cutting for Stone, we all had to wait 10 years for this new book. But I think we can all agree that the wait was worth it, especially if you haven't read it, you're in for a treat. You know, The Covenant of Water is one of those books that you will just luxuriate in. And when I think about Covenant, I think that that Abraham Verghese, he makes good on the novelist covenant with the writer. And that covenant is, trust me with your attention, and I will reward you with a tale worth inhabiting. 
and rewarded we are. So ladies and gentlemen, please welcome my friend, colleague, and role model, Dr. Abraham Verghese. <laughs> Good evening, everyone. What a pleasure for me to be here with you this evening. Um, Danielle, thank you for that wonderful, wonderful introduction. I'm sure when she mentioned the title of my short story, you were left wondering what the rest of it was about. The, the full title, uh, can you all hear me, by the way? The full title of that short story is, If Brains Was Gas, You Wouldn't Have Enough to Prime a Pissant's Go-Kart Round a Cheerio. <laughs> And that's a southern expression. Not a southern Indian expression, but a, a southern expression from, from the US. Uh, it's such a privilege for me to be here. Uh, I was telling Danielle that in all my years of coming to New York, for some reason, I've never been to Brooklyn until today. And I have all these writer friends who all live in Brooklyn. I've read the most extraordinary novels set in Brooklyn and I was beginning to feel this was like the Truman, the Truman Show, where Brooklyn didn't really exist, and they were all deliberately meeting me in Manhattan. But uh, what a privilege to be in this great center. And thank you to the, the Center for Fiction for making this uh, come about. Some very, very important people in this audience uh, in my life, my mentors, both in the writing sphere, in the medical sphere. It'll take a long time to acknowledge every one of them. Uh, but my editor, Peter Blackstock, is here who made this book possible, and I really want to salute him and all the folks at Grove for their wonderful, wonderful work in bringing this book about. My agent, Mary Evans, uh, signed me sight unseen in Iowa. I was actually at the Iowa Writers' Workshop moonlighting because I had cashed in my tenured faculty job to go to Iowa, and I was away one weekend mo moonlighting, and. Mary had evidently come through, picked up one of my short stories on a Sunday, I think, and then on a Tuesday she called me from New York and said, hi, I'm Mary Evans, the New Yorker really likes your story. Would you be okay if they published it? <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we never actually got to meet till a, a couple of years later. Everything has been, was sight unseen, but um, she's been an extraordinary uh, person in, in making my writing career happen. So. Thank you so much, Mary. Thank you. Uh, uh, many other people to acknowledge, uh, dear friends who've helped me with the writing process, Courtney, Nathan. Uh, my mentor in medicine, the man who's responsible for bringing me to Stanford, Ralph Horowitz, is here. Ralph, thank you for everything you've done. Uh, and last but not least, and there are many people I have not uh, mentioned, but I, uh, it'll take too long. Uh, my partner, Kerry Costanzo, thank you for being here. So. Um, I thought what we'd do, Daniela and I agreed, that I would try and tell you a little bit about this new novel, how it came about. Uh, with your blessing, I'd like to read you two short passages that don't give too much away. It's a little perilous talking about a new novel at this stage, because most of you might have heard about it, read reviews about it, but uh, I don't want to, you know, to spoil it for you. And it's easy, there, are, there are spoilers that are easily given away if I'm not careful, so I'm being very selective in the reading. Um, this novel, my, my first decision in trying to write a novel after Cutting for Stone was where to set it, geography. I mean, I really think that at least for me, but I think for many, many books, geography is a major character. And uh, with Cutting for Stone, I picked Ethiopia because um, I was born there, was raised there, began medical school there. I uh, spoke the language exceedingly well. It's getting a bit rusty, but I can still evidently scare the hell out of cab drivers here and there <laughs> if I'm not careful as to when I begin to uh, speak in Amharic. But I hesitated about set setting a novel in India, even though I thought I knew India pretty well. I spent all my summers there. I went to medical school the second time around in India uh, and spent even more time with my grandparents. Uh, but the genesis of this novel really had a lot to do with my mother. My mother was an extraordinary woman. She died at the age of 93. And uh, when she, she was born in the 1920s. 
and um, had a college degree in physics, a master's degree, very unusual for a woman at the time. And she, uh, just about the time the British uh, granted us independence after centuries of colonial oppression, there's no other word for it, uh, my mother found that there were no jobs to be had. So she answered an ad for a teaching position in Ethiopia. And can you picture this, a, a young woman in a sari setting sail for Aden and then making her way to Ethiopia, sight unseen for, for a position. The kind of courage that must have taken. Uh, she met my father there, also a teacher, uh, recruited the same way. And as a result, um, you know, my, my brother and I were born there. My older brother and I, my younger brother, was born elsewhere. And our destinies were completely altered. Uh, in her 50s, she came to America with my father. They had read the writing on the wall in Ethiopia and felt that the country was about to implode. I disagreed. I stayed on. I was in medical school. Turned out they were right. I was wrong. Uh, and my mother became a, a teacher in, uh, uh, of junior high in Springfield, New Jersey, not far away. And in her 70s, she retired to Pompano Beach, Florida. And uh, when she was in her 70s, my five-year-old niece, she's, you know, no longer five, she's a married woman, uh, my, my five-year-old niece, who is my mother's namesake, said to my mother, Amachi, Amachi means grandmother, what was it like when you were a five-year-old girl? And my mother was just so taken with this question. You know, where, would she, where does she begin to describe her experience uh, growing up, by no means deprived, but nevertheless in a house without electricity or running water, which I thought was very quaint when I was a child. I mean, I enjoyed the way at night, you know, all these beautiful lamps would be lit, and I loved being one of the people drawing water from the well in the morning and stocking up all the tanks. But uh, how would she convey this? And so mom began to write in a school notebook, in her elegant script, uh, a description of all these anecdotes of her childhood. And she was a very good artist, and so she sketched everything, implements, costumes, um, anything that was relevant to the story. The anecdotes were very familiar to my brothers and I, uh, but something had happened over the decades. They had become much embellished and much more colorful than we remembered them which might be a feature of aging, I don't know. Um, but I, I saw this document when she first produced it, when she was 70. And then when she was in her 90s, I picked it up again, and I suddenly had this epiphany that really, this is the place to set a new novel. Uh, Mom was delighted. Uh, she, began, she became my most earnest research assistant, and I would always ask her questions about little rituals and details, and. Into her 90s, she was calling me up with an anecdote that she just remembered, and I never had the heart to tell her that she'd call me just the day before with the same anecdote. <laughs> uh, sadly, Mum did not live to, uh, to see the book come out, but she was well aware that I was doing it. And I was speaking to my father yesterday and saying, you know, the extraordinary three weeks that I've just lived through, where you know the book has been so beautifully received, wonderfully. Uh, you know, embraced by Oprah. There's no other word for it. She just really has blessed it. Uh, I said, I, I just feel like mom is watching. Mom has something to do with this. And dad said very emphatically, she is. Of course she is. You know? And I, I, I loved his certainty. And I must say, I feel that she's, she's still enjoying, she's enjoying this as much as I am. Um, so the story, The Covenant of Water, is set in Kerala, where our parents come from which is a coastal strip on the western edge of the southern tip of India. It's a very narrow coastal strip, mountains on one side, the Arabian Ocean on the other side, 40 rivers coming down from the mountains to the sea, and a lattice work of lagoons and, and canals and backwaters uh, uh, connecting everybody. And the annual monsoon feels like the the giant beating heart of this circulatory system. So you can't escape the metaphor of water if you, if you visit Kerala. Now we come from a small community uh, of Christians within the state of Kerala. And our Christianity, we believe, 
hails from the moment that St. Thomas, the apostle, landed on the coast of uh, India in Kerala in 52 AD. This isn't far-fetched. It's quite possible because for centuries there had been a very vigorous trade in spices. Spices grow wild on, on these slopes. And Arab sailors would capture the uh, annual monsoon winds and sail down in their dhows, pick up the spices for a song, and sell it for a fortune back in Europe. And for, for many, many centuries, the Europeans were desperate to find the source of the spices. And finally, in the 1400s, Vasco da Gama sailed around the Horn of Africa, captured an Arab pilot, and tortured him, and finally found the secret to where this was coming from, and landed in present-day Kerala. The book opens with a 12-year-old bride. And the second line of the book is, the saddest day of a girl's life is the day of her wedding. Now, to most Western readers, this is a shocking way to start a book. Uh, it needs a little bit of explanation. So my grandmother married at the age of 12, my great-grandmother at the same age, perhaps younger. But what people may not realize is they were marrying 10 and 11-year-old boys. They were basically entering a new household becoming just one of the many children in the household. And very often, most often, the mother-in-law would become an even more important figure to them than their own mother, because they certainly knew them for much, much longer. And it was a sad day because you were leaving the home you once knew, but you were now entering this home that would be yours for the rest of your life. And uh, someone told me recently an anecdote about my grandmother that when she was a little girl, she told her mother-in-law, who was like her mother, she said, Amachi, there's one of those annoying boys, that one over there, we should get rid of him, send him away. That was her future husband, my, <laughs> my grandfather. Um, but I, I love the idea of beginning with this family and following it through three generations uh, and beginning with this young bride who grows into, I think, a remarkable a person. Uh, I think there are many novels where mothers are portrayed as evil or dark or flawed, but I like the idea of paying tribute to people like my grandmother and my great-grandmother who lived very simple lives that the world would never know about, and yet in their faith, in their simplicity, in their rituals, in the way they loved their families and saw them grow and sprout, uh, they were heroic, uh, almost saintly, and it was lovely to be able to bring such a character to life. So I'm going to read you a passage from very early on. And uh, I've always admired it when writers early in a book, sometimes in the first paragraph, but I couldn't pull that off, foreshadow the entire novel in just one little paragraph. They kind of tell you what the whole novel is about. And this passage that I picked, I hope, does that uh, because it's it's the young bride, but suddenly she's leaping forward to imagine when she's a grandmother. Um, I should tell you also before I read this book, before I read, that um, I auditioned for the role of narrator for my book. <laughs> Which is not as outrageous as it sounds, because I think when writers read their own fiction, it's a little bit of a red flag. You, it's not a given that they're going to be good at, at reading the book. And I wanted to give it a try. And if someone could do it much better than I could, I would be very happy for them to do it, because my goal was just to do the best job possible. However, there were a lot of ethnic terms in this book. And I didn't want to cringe while somebody mangled you know, words that I, had, uh, that I knew were, were another way. And it's quite easy to do. So I was very delighted when I was picked to do it. Um, <laughs> I'm not sure why you're laughing. It really was a, an audition. Uh, I had a lot to learn. I had a lot to learn because you have to learn to perform the book, uh, to learn how to you know, alter the pitch of my voice ever so slightly, to, to, to delineate the gender of the person speaking. I had to learn to put on a Glaswegian accent, an upper crust English accent, a, a Gordy accent from Newcastle, 
a Madrasi accent, a Tamilian accent, but not to overdo it. So it was really quite a learning experience, which I very much enjoyed. I mention this only because if this sounds a bit over the top, I'm just following the way I was told to perform. <laughs> so forgive me in advance. So again, this is the young bride, but suddenly on page 15, it's all leaping forward. Happened is happened, our young bride will say, when she becomes a grandmother, and when her granddaughter, her namesake, begs for a story about their ancestors. The little girl, the granddaughter, has heard rumors that theirs is a genealogy chock full of secrets, and that her ancestors include slavers, murderers, and a defrocked bishop. Child, the past is past, happened as happened, and furthermore, the past is different every time I remember it. <laughs> I'll tell you about the future, the one you will make. But the child insists. Where should the story begin? With doubting Thomas, who insisted on seeing Christ's wounds before he'd believe? With other martyrs to the faith? What the child clamors for is the story of their own family, of the widower's house into which her grandmother married, a landlocked dwelling in a land of water, a house full of mysteries. But such memories are woven from gossamer threads. Time eats holes in the fabric, and these she must darn with myth and fable. The grandmother is certain of a few things. A tale that leaves its imprint on a listener tells the truth about how the world lives. And so, unavoidably, the story must be about families, about their victories and wounds, and their departed, including the ghosts who linger. The story must offer instructions for living in God's realm, where joy never spares one from sorrow. A good story goes beyond what a forgiving God cares to do. It reconciles families and unburdens them of secrets, secrets whose bond is stronger than blood. But in their revealing, as in their keeping, secrets can tear a family apart. And um, I was I've been intrigued by secrets uh, as a child as I observed our rituals in our community of intermarriage and arranged marriages where it was very easy for a girl's prospects, usually the girl more than the boy, for a girl's prospects to be torpedoed by a rumor or a hint of madness or epilepsy and sometimes these were malicious, sometimes it was true and so families invested a great deal in keeping that sort of thing quite secret. And so in my story, um, I gave this family a secret. Um, basically, in this family, going back many, many generations, there's always one or more individual who avoids water, which in Kerala is very strange, because you grow up learning to swim before you walk. There's water everywhere. But these individuals avoid water, and despite that fact, they wind up drowning in the most inauspicious bodies of water, irrigation canals, puddles. Uh, and the great conceit of this book is that this family is concealing this condition because it can taint their reputation. And uh, by the end of the book, by the third generation, the, the, the secret, the mystery is revealed. Um, if you're wondering, this is actually a real condition. So as, as a long time uh, teacher of medicine at the bedside, I love to keep in my back pocket a collection of rare diseases that I love. I've had fascination with these conditions. It doesn't matter that there's only 36 reported patients in the world. It still has a name and uh, you know it's colorful. And this is one of the conditions that I would trot out and quiz my residents and interns on. And it really suited the bill uh, for this novel. So um, I, I don't want to obviously tell you what it is, but in picking the time period 1900 to 1977, 
not only was I choosing the most fascinating era in human history, two world wars, uh, the most you know, pivotal area in Indian history where after centuries of colonization, centuries, uh, India was finally a free country. But I was also picking a, a most interesting era in medicine where many things just had names, but by the 70s, the biological basis and often the cure for these conditions was well established. And I loved being able to write a story that encompassed that sweep. <coughs> Sorry. <coughs> Every cough is suspect these days, isn't it? <laughs> we were on a train from, uh, from where? I'm so lost. Washington, from Washington, D.C. to here. And uh, I found it useful to keep track of the coughs per minute <laughs> as a general index of what's going on. Um, I am, um, for the last piece that I'll read, and I'll, then, then I'm going to have a wonderful conversation with my colleague and fellow physician writer, uh, whose work I'm so proud of. Uh, but before I do that, I'm going to read you one more section. And I have to explain that this involves a character by the name of Broker Onion. And uh, it's, it's not uncommon in, in our society, our culture, for everybody to have a pet name. Uh, so my name is Abraham Verghese. Um, I have a pet name, but I'm not about to tell you what it is. <laughs> However, uh, many members of my immediate family only know me by that name and would be, maybe not so now, but would, would be mystified in the past to, if someone talked about Abraham Verghese, they would have no idea who that was. And by the way, the name Verghese is really George. George became Gorgis in Greece and Borghese in Italy and Verghese in South India. So one has a Christian name, one often has, one always has a pet name, but then one often gets names like if you happen to work for the Goodyear company, then you, you get the name Goodyear Baby. Baby is your pet name, Goodyear is tagged onto it, and then forever after you're Goodyear Baby, even though you've left and joined Dunlop, you're still Goodyear Baby. <laughs> or your name is based on where you now live and work, so you could be Calcutta Baby. And uh, there's a real incident where a cousin of ours went to Calcutta, which was a major trip for him, looking for his first cousin, went to the company where, the, where this person worked, but didn't know his real name and kept referring to him as Goodyear Baby or something like that. And finally he got so mad and he made such a scene that he was arrested. And when his cousin finally found out what happened and went to retrieve him from the jail, he couldn't identify who his cousin was because he only knew him by some other <laughs> appellation like this. Uh, I mention this because there's a character here called Broker Onion, and that is actually a real uh, appellation for someone who spends his life being a marriage broker. So I knew a couple of brokers, and I was always intrigued by these figures. I remember sitting at my cousin's engagement and realizing that I was sitting next to a broker. And uh, there was great food being circulated, and I was partaking. This man never touched a morsel of anything. He had his eyes fixed on every baby, newborn, child floating around. You could tell he was cataloging these people for his future reference. Uh, so I was always, always intrigued. So in this particular scene that I'll read, and then I'll stop, uh, Broker Onion has been asked to visit by the granddaughter that you heard, you heard of much, much earlier. She's now grown up, she's a physician, and she has her own reasons for wanting the broker to visit, but of course he doesn't quite understand that. He's actually quite excited. He thinks he has a client. So um, the people in this, in this uh, short scene are Broker Onion, that's his name, Mariama, the granddaughter now grown up, and there's a third person, an older lady who's in the house. You kind of need to know that to, to understand this passage. Broker Onion's thick gray hair is parted in the center and swept back on his temples. His intelligent eyes miss nothing as he cycles up to the house. Mole, he says. Mole means daughter, and he's referring to Mariama. Mole, I remember as if it were yesterday I proposed an alliance for your father and your mother. I thought they met on a train. He smiles indulgently. Ah, train meeting, greeting maybe there. 
Loving longing may be there, but without a broker, how can families be introduced or dowry discussed or horoscopes matched? What if the horoscopes don't match, but the couple are adamant? Mariama asks. Broker Onion squeezes his eyes shut and opens them. A gesture that to outsiders might look like someone wincing with pain, but in Kerala means something specific. It's not a problem. We are just. That's all. Most impediments are minor impediments, Broker Onion says. And minor impediments are no impediment. You see, parents often have faulty memories of the exact time of birth, he says, with the patience of a priest who must regularly recite the articles of faith. Ladies, before we begin today, may I share with you three lessons I've learned in doing this for decades so that we don't waste time? First lesson, and don't take this wrong, Molly. But your generation often tries to drive the bullock cart backward. In fact, the greater the education, the more someone will make this mistake. He eyes Mariama meaningfully. The first priority is to find the right person, is it not? You must look at this proposal, then that proposal, then make a table of pluses and minuses, correct? She nods. Wrong. Wrong. First priority is set the date. (laughs) Simple. You know why? She doesn't. Because you set a date and you're committed. Tell me, Molly, if you decide to open a practice, will you wait first to see a patient walk by and then rent the building and then put up a sign? Of course not. You commit. You rent an office, sign the lease for a certain date, you get furniture, is it not? Ah, ah, my dear God, if you only knew how much time I wasted with that doctorate fellow from Berkeley in United States of California. He comes on two weeks leave. I introduce mother and him to eight first class, yay one, suitable girls. And he goes back undecided. Why? No date. (laughs) So the first lesson is to commit to a date. What's the second? Ah, ah, second lesson I already mentioned first. Maybe you weren't paying attention earlier. I said most impediments are minor impediments, the two women say in unison. Ah, ah, and minor impediments are no impediment. Thank you. Exactly. Adjustment is there. Is there a third? Certainly. There are ten rules. But these three only I share because it makes my work easier. The rest will die with me. My son sees no future in this business because of the newspaper matrimonial advertisements. God help people who try that. So the third rule is this. Looks change, but character doesn't. So... Focus on character, not looks. And to know a girl's character, you look to the girl's mother, Mariama says. Ah, correct. He nods, pleased with his pupil. And for a boy's character, you look to the boy's father, Mariama says (laughs) confidently. Wrong, he says, pleased to have lured them into his trap. Wrong. Wrong, my dear ladies, for the boy's character, again, you must look to the mother. After all, the only thing we can be certain of in this world is who our mother is. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you all all so much. Thank you. This was really wonderful. And so while you're thinking of uh, your questions, you know, I would love to just talk to you a bit about the phenomenon of doctor writers, because it is a phenomenon. There is no category really of lawyer writers, accountant writers, 
direct marketer writers, right? You know, you don't see those around, but there is sort of this whole category of doctor writers. Why do you think that is? Yeah, I mean, I've actually puzzled over it. I feel that, uh, I feel that you know, teacher writers, bus driver writers don't get sufficient credit. Um, but I think people are sort of fascinated at several levels with the idea of a doctor writer. The first is one of slight accusation. If you're a good doctor, you shouldn't have time to be writing. You should, <laughs> you should actually not be a doctor writer. But the second is, I think, um, a sense that there's some, some special insight we have into human character. I, I don't quite know what it is, but I think we're unjustly celebrated in terms of our profession, as though that gives us some automatic insight into writing. Uh, I'm constantly sent article, I mean, sent manuscripts by very, very eminent physicians who feel that this manuscript, because they wrote it and because of their eminence, should suffice to be a, you know, an international bestseller. <laughs> and, uh, you know, I think so there's a hubris that I think characterizes many doctor writers. And so uh, those of us, you and me, who've been humbled by many, many rejections, uh, I think we are writers who happen to be physicians is, is the way I look at it. I mean, that's a bit disingenuous. I think um, there's a lot about internal medicine, which happens to be both our specialties, that I think lends itself to uh, very close skills of observation. Uh, we have the practice of taking disparate facts and pulling them together with a unifying uh, diagnosis, if you like. And um, so I think there's, there's a lot about the the sort of the scholarship of medicine that's helpful to the discipline of writing. Uh, for one thing, we have lots of practice sitting our asses in chairs for hours on end, you know. Uh, we prove that through college and med school and residency. Uh, so you know that you can do hard work. But uh, what do you think? What's well, your take on yeah, that? Well, actually, I, mean, I was going to ask you one follow-up question. You wrote a piece for the Annals of Internal Medicine some years ago called What Doctors Can Learn from Novelists. And I remember you had a part, I think it was that paper, about when a patient sits with you and opens up their story, you automatically become a character in that story. Whether you buy into the whole storytelling thing or not, you become a character in that story. Is that part of it, that we are characters yeah, I mean, in stories? I think that's, you know, I mean, I think that's a much more serious answer than mine was. Thank you for that. Uh, even though you're quoting my own work. <laughs> but, uh, I mean, I think you're right. I think that we... We often have this um, major catalyst function in people's lives, and sometimes we're not entirely aware of it. Um, one of my favorite passages ever is, uh, is that describing the death of Anton Chekhov. Um, I think most of you know that Chekhov was a practicing physician, and he was a writer, a celebrated writer in his time. And uh, um, unfortunately, he died very, very young. And, and I always wonder, what might he have added to the canon of his work had he lived another 30, 40 years, which, which was his due, uh, instead of which he died so young. And uh, there's this one indelible scene to me about his death, and it's, you, you'll find it in the biography of Chekhov by, by Troyat. And uh, may I recite that passage? Please. I hope I remember it. But uh, Troyat describes Chekhov's death as follows, and just to set it up, uh, in the month before he died, or in the year before he died, Chekhov got married to a stage actress by the name of Olga Knipper, I believe her name was. She knew he was dying, he knew he was dying, but they decided to go ahead. And in the last days of his life, he got this urge to travel to the Black Forest of Germany, and Olga, not wanting to do anything not to oblige this dying man, took him to the Baden-Weiler Spa in Germany. And it certainly seemed to help him when he got there. His color improved. He was you know, happy. He wrote back letters home saying he feels so good. But then uh, late in the night, one night, all hell broke loose. He began to have massive hemoptysis, meaning he was coughing up blood, which is a terrifying symptom both for, both for the patient and the physician, because not only are they losing blood, their airway is being compromised as they lose blood. And so they sent for the spa physician, a man by the name of Dr. Schwerer. And I've always had great empathy for Dr. Schwerer in this scene because here's this guy who found this lucrative gig in the Baden-Weiler Spa of Germany. 
I know the worst thing he deals with is twisted ankles and and all of a sudden late at night he's being called to the bedside of the man who arguably was the most famous physician of his era who was dying and so uh, the passage goes like this um, Dr. Schwarer arrived at two o'clock and Chekhov lucid to the end sat up mastered his weak German and said, Ich sterbe, I am dying. Dr. Schwarer sent, Dr. Schwarer administered a camphor injection, but Chekhov's heart failed to react. Dr. Schwarer was about to send for an oxygen pillow when Chekhov, lucid to the end, said, what's the use, doctor? Before it comes, I will be a corpse. And so, Dr. Schwarer sent for a bottle of champagne. When it came, Chekhov said to Olga, his wife, it's been so long since I had champagne. He drained the glass, lay down, turned to his left side, and stopped breathing. He had passed from life to death with characteristic simplicity. It was July the 2nd, 1904, three o'clock in the morning. A large black-winged moth had flown in through the window and was beating maddeningly against the lamp. The sound was very distracting. Dr. Schwarer withdrew after a few words of consolation. All at once, there was a joyous explosion. The cork popped out of the champagne bottle. The, mo the moth escaped into the sultry night. Silence returned. When dawn broke, Olga was still sitting there staring at her husband's face. She would say his face was peaceful, knowing, calm. She would write, there were no human voices, there were no everyday sounds, there was only peace, beauty, and the grandeur of death. I don't know about you, but I've been deeply affected by that passage. Thank you. It wasn't me, it was, it was Troyat's words, I'm just reciting them. But I, was, I, I was deeply affected I, I by that passage. I think you're onto with, with Chekhov. I mean, I think that doctors, I mean, we take histories and physicals, so we take stories. But I think more than that, we listen to stories. And when you mention Chekhov, I think of the short story, Misery, which has the epitaph, To Whom Shall I Tell My Grief? And if you know the story, it's about um, Ivan, the sledge driver. And he's driving the sledge back and forth in Siberia during Christmas week. And uh, his young son has died that week. And with every uh, customer, he tries to tell his story, but nobody wants to listen. They're too busy drinking, vodka. And the whole night goes by, he's never told his story. His shift ends, he brings his sleigh to the you know, uh, barn, he takes the horse, and he starts brushing the horse, and he tells the story to the horse, who, of course, doesn't answer, but it's enough to have listened. And I do believe that in medicine, particularly in internal medicine, we do a lot of listening, a lot of bearing witness. There's so much that we can't cure but we can bear witness, and I think that we hear stories. And I think what you pointed out in your article is the listening for the details, for both diagnostic clues, but for contextual uh, clues for the patient's life. And I think, I hope to think, that's why doctors love to write. But you're right, there are a lot of great lawyer writers out there too. <laughs> if I may add a little addendum to that story, the reason I cite that story, quite, I mean, apart from the wonderful example you just gave, is that I've always identified with Dr. Schwarz's helplessness. You know, he, he tries camphor, it doesn't work, he's gonna send for oxygen, but then he does a switch. He, he, he has listened and taken in the story, and he does something extraordinary. He orders champagne. And at least in the telling, it does seem as though the champagne is the catalyst that makes everything that follow. You know, he takes a glass, goes to his left side, stops breathing, the moth escapes, the cork pops out of the champagne bottle. And to me, that story has always represented the fact that we're often catalysts in stories without necessarily being aware of just how much of a catalyst we can be, rarely as dramatically as that, but we always are playing an element in story. And I think very much to the, the time in the HIV sort of depth before protease inhibitors, before it became a treatable disease, a lot of what we did was the, sent the yes. equivalent of the champagne of just listening to the stories because there was not a lot that we could do. And there were a lot of stories in, in those years, for sure. Mm -hmm. um, for the audience, you are welcome to ask a question. Um, raise your hand so the person with the microphone can come to you. Uh, there's a question over there. 
So the microphone, then maybe you can even stand up and with the microphone. It's not a major question, but I'm glad that opportunity of asking. I'm a fan, admirer, and there is a point at, towards the end of the book where... Don't give anything away. Yeah, please don't give away the ending of this book. <laughs> I'm not giving anything away. Elsie has a, a painting, and the painting, she sends the painting to Madras every year, and she doesn't win a prize. This time, she won, and she was happy. But it turned out that she, this year, changed her name from Elsie to a man's name, T. Elsiana to E. Thanat. And it turned out that because of a male artist submitted it, she won the prize. My question is that you have written wonderfully of various problems and carried those points through, whether my own country or breaking for stones, what a, in a fascinating manner. I was looking for follow-up on DEI. Are you planning to take diversity, equity, and opportunity further in another book, just as you explained to us today why you wrote this book. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, may I just say uh, that uh, uh, your daughter sitting next to you, I, I got to know when uh, a member of your family was being treated at Stanford and she reached out to me. She wrote to me earlier today to say that you were determined to come at the age of 91. I hope I'm not embarrassing you by <laughs> mentioning your age. And I'm enormously touched by by your question, by your being here. I know you've driven a long way, so thank you so much for that. Uh, I'm truly touched. Um, I think your question is a good one. I need to wrestle with it and think about it some more. I had a lot of fun learning about art, learning about sculpture, but I, I can't pretend to be any sort of expert. Um, uh, and I, I, I'm, I'm going to get back to you in perhaps in a more considered way than try to come up with something smart. But I'm actually going to dodge your question by saying, Thank you for being here. It's very special to me. A question, uh, two questions in the back there. So I have a question about language. Um, I'm a theologian, uh, and a theologian named Raimondo Panikar, whose uh, mother hails from Kerala, was so fluent at languages that he wrote in at least six and picked the language he wanted to write in on the basis of which language he thought was best for articulating the ideas. Um, this kind of facility most of us can't even dream about. But it raises an intimate question about the languages we think in, dream in, and write in. For many of us who've left Kerala, uh, very long time ago. I can do some thinking in Malayalam, but mostly ordinary household things. If I want to think anything serious, I have to think it in English. And so I write also only in English. There's a kind of ambivalence and pain in this. Uh, and I wonder sometimes 
what I've lost by never learning to write or read in, Eng uh, in Malayalam. I'm wondering if you could say something about the, the way you wrestle, if you wrestle with this, with this question, particularly because there are so many Malayalam words in the text. It's as though you're creating a new kind of English, maybe to navigate this problem among, among others. Um, so just love to hear you speak about this. Yeah, I mean, thank you for, for that question. I can really relate. Um, so um, I was born in Ethiopia, and I actually grew up with English as my first language. My parents spoke Malayalam to each other and to us to some degree, but uh, so we could understand Malayalam very well, but we weren't necessarily fluent in it, and all our friends in the compound were an international group of children. So English was our common language and my first language. And when we went on summer vacations to my grandparents, we would only hear Malayalam, which is the language of Kerala. Uh, my brother learned to read and write, kind of, and I, I was even poorer than him in that. And that was part of my hesitation in, uh, in choosing Kerala as a place to set the novel. Uh, Malayalis, which is what they call people from Kerala, are very, very critical people. So <laughs> when you stood up and identified yourself, I thought, oh, here it comes. But, uh, <laughs> I was very pleased that, uh, if anything, we have an alliance. Um, yeah, so I mean, I, uh, what I did is I relied very heavily on resources, uh, both in terms of people who were very fluent in the language, but also scholars. So I had a, a woman who's a well-known translator from Malayalam to English. And, uh, you know, but this is what I'm doing. I'm writing in English, and I'm setting the story there, and, you know, at some level, uh, you know, people can say, well, you don't, you, don't, you don't know this or you don't speak the language, but to me, my only ambition with any book is a good story well told. And uh, I think that's all that really matters. And though uh, if I go to India on a book tour, I am, you know, I'm, I'm a little hesitant on the kind of questions I'm going to get. But on the other hand, I think there's such a vast diaspora of Indians from Kerala in various places that you know, I'm one of the voices of that diaspora, and this is the language I happen to write in, the legacy of our long colonial history. So there it is. You know, I don't think I should be apologetic about it, but um, I completely identify with what you're saying. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, another question back there. Oh, hi, my name is Maggie. This has been absolutely wonderful and so inspiring and joyful. Um, I wonder if you can talk a little bit about your writing process. Um, you know, this is this kind of a secret world that you turn to in the middle of the night in between your many other commitments and practicing. Uh, and also, how does that, or in what ways does the, that, the, your writing, your own personal writing process sustain you over many years? Yeah, I mean, I, I wish, uh, that's a question that always embarrasses me because it suggests that I have a, a regular practice of some kind. And, uh, actually, when Ralph, who was chairman of medicine at, at Stanford, recruited me, uh, one of the things I asked for was uh, a second office, and I still have it, with somebody else's name on it and no telephone, and some protected writing time. And I think the, the greatness of Ralph, the greatness of Stanford, is that they saw my writing as, their, as a research equivalent and protected the time. So I did a lot of writing uh, you know, at work, so to speak, but I also did a ton of writing at nights and weekends because it turned out that this protected time that Ralph gave me, I was the worst enemy of that time. I kept booking things and patients in that time. Uh, so I've always written whenever I can. And uh, I wish I could say I was very systematic in how I did that. Uh, people always want to know, do you write on a computer uh, or by pencil or pen? I, I do write on the screen but I always try to edit on paper. There's something about, you know, the computer gives you this illusion that you can go all over this, you know, thousand page manuscript, but in fact, you're limited to one page at a time. Whereas stacks of paper give you this ability to say these 40 pages go here, or as my editor Peter might say, these 100 pages are beautiful, but they belong in another book, <laughs> you know? <laughs> you need stacks of paper, I think to be able to make those kinds of decisions. So um, that's the closest I can get to an answer about technique. And what, can you 
talk a little bit about switching from nonfiction to fiction. I mean, one of the fears of fiction or a novel is that there's so many choices, like walking into Costco, a million choices. I'd rather have a bodega with just one choice. Because nonfiction, right, the story of the tennis partner, there's a story. You get to describe it artistically, but the story exists. But fiction, every single character has unlimited choices, and the permutations can be overwhelming. How do you navigate that? Well, that's interesting. So, um, you know, I, I always loved to read. I was a great reader as a child, and uh, I, I never had any ambitions to become a writer, I, none. The only reason I am a writer is uh, when I trained in infectious disease in Boston and when I moved to Tennessee in 83, no, 85, a city with a population of 50,000, Johnson City, uh, I was told after living through an intense period of the HIV epidemic at Boston City Hospital, I was told that in the hinterland, in a town of 50,000, I could expect to see one patient with HIV every other year. Instead, in about, in a few years, I had 100 people with HIV, a hundredfold more than anyone would have predicted for that town. And uh, I wrote a scientific paper describing the reasons for that number. It wasn't that the town was a hotbed of sexual intrigue and duplicity, which it was, by the way, but that wasn't the, <laughs> that wasn't the explanation. It was I had stumbled onto a paradigm of migration, a young man growing up in a small town, leaving for the reasons you and I leave small towns, jobs, education, opportunity. Uh, but they were also leaving because they were gay and didn't want to live that lifestyle under the scrutiny of their <coughs> friends and relatives. They came to the big city, uh, spent decades in the big cities, and tragically, at some point, the virus found them, and they were now coming back. And I felt that the, the cold, unimaginative language of science didn't begin to capture the tragic nature of this voyage, didn't begin to capture the, the grief of the families, didn't begin to capture my heartache uh, at watching this unfold again and again, uh, primarily with men who were my age at the time, and so that's what I decided. I want to tell the story. I never thought I'd tell it except through fiction. And when Mary published, uh, got, got my first short story, Lilacs, into the New Yorker, I thought, well, I'm on my way. I'm going to tell this as fiction. It's a longer tale as to why I didn't, but uh, it turned out that you know, uh, uh, the New Yorker asked for a proposal on nonfiction, uh, a nonfiction piece on AIDS in a small town in America. And, they turned it down for many reasons. Uh, one is the new editor who came on board didn't want it, Tina Brown. I would do other work for her, but she wasn't interested in that. And Mary said, this is a nonfiction book proposal. And so we sold it. And I had to learn to write nonfiction. I really uh, never set out to do that. I thought I would tell the AIDS story through fiction. I really do believe that paragraph I read you, fiction is the great lie that tells the truth about how the world lives. And uh, you know, somewhat reluctantly, but uh, but a hundred thousand dollar advance can make you less reluctant. So <laughs> uh, I told, I decided to learn how to write nonfiction. And, and my 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 sense is that, just as you said, I think that I'm told that nonfiction outsells fiction ten to one or something like that. Um, and I think it's because if something really happened, the reader has an inherent interest in it. And uh, on the other hand, if you make it up, you have to work 10 times harder to get the reader to get in there and you know, not, not break the fictional dream. An example I often use, because people find this hard to swallow, is if I made up a story about an African-American kid who excelled in college football and went on to the NFL, but to a so-so team. I mean, went on to college, won the Heisman Trophy, went on to the NFL, but to a so-so team. Uh, and then after his football career, uh, um, married a beautiful blonde woman, settled in Brentwood, LA, had two kids, became estranged from his wife, wound up being accused of, mur of murdering her and her lover or boyfriend, took off in a chase in a white Bronco down the freeway, <laughs> was acquitted because the glove didn't fit. As fiction, this is tawdry. Nobody's, nobody would take this. <laughs> But because it really happened, look how many books came out of that. So that's my, that's my thesis. And uh, <laughs> I love writing fiction. I, I, I don't know that I would go back to writing nonfiction, but I, might, I, I well might. I just don't know. 
I know we're, we're coming to the end of the hour. One uh, last question. We have one quick. more question in here and then one from our live stream. Hi, thank you so much for joining us tonight. I'm a fellow physician. So first, I just want to comment on your power of observation. It's just unbelievably outstanding. But I've had the pleasure of listening to the audiobook, and I'm just dying to know how are you able to master these, like a Scottish accent, especially from your background? <laughs> or did you grow up around people from Scotland as a child? How did you master all these different accents? So thank you so much. Thank you. I mean, so it's not as though I could just turn on the Scottish accents when I want. So there were some phrases that were really tricky. So uh, I have several Scottish friends, one in Edinburgh who was a great resource. And uh, while I was recording, we came upon this one line that was just a tongue twister. So I called up Ewan Ashley, who's from Glasgow and after many decades in America, still has a thick Glaswegian accent. And I said, Ewan, don't ask me why, but just read this line on your phone that I just texted you. Uh, just say it the way you normally say it. He did. I thanked him, and then, and then I practiced, practiced, and then we hit the record button. So, um, if it seems to sort of flow from me, it was hardly flowing. It was more, much more effortful for some of the accents, but others were, were less so. But thank you so much for your for your kind words. Did you say you're a physician? Yeah. You know, one of the most wonderful things for me. Uh, on this book tour is to run into uh, you know, many physicians. Uh, some of them are my former students and some of them are former residents, but there's just many of you who, uh, I don't know, they, you, you come and I'm just so touched by it. But I'm particularly touched when, and this has happened several times, when someone tells me that my book brought them to medicine, that they were in college or somewhere, and of all the accolades my books could ever, ever accomplish, that, that to me is the singular most powerful thing that writing can do because the book brought me to medicine. So uh, I just wanted to say thank you for coming. And if there are other physicians here, thank you for whatever it is you see in Danielle's work, in my work. And thank you. Thank you for being here. And if you plan to have a heart attack at a reading, it would be at one of these readings. That's your best place to do it. Um, so thank you all. We have one question from the live stream. Sorry. Um, this is a question from Bruce Campbell. Would incorporating literary fiction into medical school and residency training help our youngest colleagues see that they are catalysts for their patients' stories? If so, how do we do that? So getting literary fiction into medical training, what do you think? Uh, I didn't quite get the entire question. Can you repeat it perhaps sure. for our... Um, do you think we can incorporate literary fiction into medical training? Would that help our medical students? And, and if so, how would we actually do that? Yeah, I would say categorically yes. I mean, I think most medical humanities programs uh, believe in that. So you can teach a medical student about child abuse, uh, refer them to a pediatric textbook, but you have them read Dorothy Allison's Bastard Out of Carolina, and they will feel what child abuse is. Uh, you want to teach them about end of life, you can point them to a palliative care textbook or send them to the death of Ivan Illich by Tolstoy, and you will feel. Um, you know, so we all teach these stories. The trouble is that we're, we're getting medical students at a point when very often they're, they're drinking from the fire hose of information they have to master, and it's really hard to convince them that this is important. But I think very often, even if, you, even if they resist, you teach it to them, and many, many years later, I'd like to think that they come to points in their life where they look back and then they appreciate those stories and they seek them out. So to me, the short answer is, is yes. And I think there's a particular role for poetry. Um, a, it's shorter, and med students don't have time to read a four-page story. But if you think about poetry, it's all about metaphor, about interpreting metaphors. And I think that patients speak to us in metaphor. They don't come in and say, I have vasculitis. They come in and say, oh, it hurts here, I feel this. And I think your book, My Own Country, really illustrated the metaphors that patients speak in and being attuned to interpreting metaphors, so using those literary muscles is a real training. So I think there's really diagnostic value, particularly in poetry as well as in fiction. I must try that more. I haven't been doing as much poetry as I have. <laughs> well, uh, so I think we're at the end of the hour. So thank you to the audience out May the I make stream. one quick announcement? Yes, and one announcement so, from Dr. Um, Briggs. I just wanted to say there are many of my friends here and relatives, uh, and um, we pre-signed books because I have seven more stops to make on this book tour, 
And as an infectious disease physician, statistically, I know the odds of my falling sick are, are pretty good if I interacted as much as I want to. And that's why we pre-sign books. Uh, so in the same vein, forgive me if I don't get to say hello to every one of you who wants to say hi to me. I think some of my friends are going to come and seek me out and my relatives, but uh, uh, please understand and don't think that this Oprah stuff has gone to his head. Uh, <laughs> far from it. I've, I've been uh, humbled by, by it, and it's been very special, and I wish I could chat with each of you. So thank you so much. Thank you for doing this. Uh, we'll get you after the